moving from a place of invisibility into a place of visibility for the whole, for a community. Each time that happens, it's amazing how transformative such spaces can be just by attending with your mind and heart wide open. Welcome to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel, a podcast that illuminates the path to collective healing at the intersection of science and mysticism. In his conversations with visionaries, innovators, artists, and healers, Thomas invites guests into a relational experience that allows inspiration and innovation to emerge. This is the Point of Relation. Our guests for today's episode are Antoinette Klatsky and Otto Scharmer. Antoinette Klatsky is a facilitator, systems change leader, entrepreneur, and strategist dedicated to radical regeneration for people and the planet. She currently serves as the Vice President of Programs and Partnerships of the Eileen Fisher Foundation and serves on the board of the Presidency Institute. Otto Scharmer is a senior lecturer in the MIT Management Sloan School and the founding chair of the Presencing Institute. He introduced the concept of presency, learning from the emerging future, in his best selling books, Theory U and Presence. We hope you enjoy this conversation. So, a warm welcome. My name is Thomas Hübel. This is the Point of Relation, my podcast, and I'm happy to be sitting here with Antoinette and Odo. So, a warm welcome to my podcast, both of you. Thanks for having us, Thomas. Thank you for having us. Mm, I'm very happy because I think we had already many great conversations, and I had the feeling every time we are in conversation, we actually add a little bit more to the puzzle, and uh, and we 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 see more together, we inspire each other. So I walk away at least every time, and I'm inspired, and I, it keeps me thinking, it keeps me innovative. So it's lovely. And so, first of all, thank you for that. And also for the mutual commitment to actually be really interested in cultural change. And I think we we all devote our lives to that mission in one way or the other. So, and so my my first question that I would like to talk about is um, in like looking through the collective or systemic trauma lens, I'm wondering, I think we need collective social healing spaces and we need also spaces for social innovation i think that's very much along your work and so let's see what can we actually or what's needed right now to help us to kind of up level our capacity to move evolve change adapt to the current situation and actually contribute maybe some healing through to the entire collective system so what helps us what skills what abilities what processes what do we need to put in place in order to um, have some more progress on that level and maybe you both can speak a little bit about it and then we riff off each other there Sure, I can I can jump in, um, and you know it is a, a joy to be with both of you here, and and I think both of you um, have been you know really leading the thinking in this in this work of how we build what I think auto you term as the the architectures of connection that we that we need um, that are kind of opposite to the architectures of separation that we continue to perpetuate, and so um, you know for me I've been kind of learning and growing in both of these streams, um, because as we think about healing, Thomas, you talk about it not being an end goal, um, but something that we're continuously working towards and evolving. And I think for me, as I've been in that stage of growth around that um, continuous healing process, it's um, for me about having a language of the heart and having a, a connection to my heart space that is accepting of um, the pain that comes with being alive as much as the joy and not just going for the kind of instant gratification, but really, you know, staying connected in any moment to, um, not just my head space, but really the, the space of the heart. And, um, and in, 
you know, a lot of situations I've found it, it feels easier to just say, no, I'm not going to listen to that. You know, uh, I'm not going to listen to the anger. I'm not going to listen to the pain. I'm not going to listen to even the joy. I'm just going to do what I quote unquote need to do. Um, and, and I think that, you know, gets us into the kind of business as usual or the idea of, you know, what I need to study or who I need to become. And, um, that keeps me in a box. And I think when we step out of that box, you know, I've been working with Eileen Fisher for close to 15 years. And um, a lot of what I've been invited to do is to actually step out of the box and be in my full self and be in my most creative self. Um, and that is what has allowed us to make real changes um, in how we operate in the world. So for me, that's just a little taste based on my own personal experience, but very much about um, connecting to the space around the heart, having, you know, as Otto, you talk about an open mind, open heart, open will, and doing that not just as an individual, but doing that with um, with communities and with a collective and with society as a whole. Yeah, that um, that really resonates. And um, I think your, um, your question, Tom, is um, so the... Um, architectures of uh, or, or the collective healing spaces and spaces for social innovation as you put it um uh that is um uh really uh, a huge gap right in our uh, societal infrastructures that we have um really across all countries uh, right now and um if you um what i find so uh, in the Presencing Institute, um, uh, Antoinette and I and others often work kind of with um, leaders on innovation um, initiatives in a variety of different sectors. So when you, for example, look at um, um, the future of learning, right? It's all about whole person, whole systems learning. When you look at the future of health, it's not just about better healthcare delivery, but it's really about moving from reacting against the symptoms of sickness towards strengthening the sources of health and healing. And um, when you look into food and um, agriculture, um, you have a shift from, you know, conventional to regenerative uh, agriculture, which really is uh, not just um, you know, doing less bad things, you, you use less um, uh, chemicals, but it's, it's really kind of on a deeper and more intim intimate and also more uh, heart-based relationship to um, how we co-evolve with our uh, with Mother Earth and with our living ecosystems. And the same in business, right? From uh, And finance, right? essentially in both fields from extractive way of uh, operating to regenerative way of operating. And that's um, where I, I think when you really um, look uh, into uh, uh, the cutting edge of all these um, developments, they move into the same space. And yes, it's a space of healing, but it's not just a space of uh, innovation. I would say it's really a space of regeneration and transformation. So it's really uh, addressing kind of the deeper root issues and allowing from there something new to be born. And what is it that's being born? It's not just kind of a one neat little new project in the midst of uh, uh, the rest, but it's really uh, a new way of how we are walking and living together. And that's a different word for civilization, right? Because a civilization is essentially a set of structures that organize how we work and live together as humans, uh, you know, as a, as a, uh, uh, in a larger ecosystem that beca we become more and more aware of. So these deeper spaces are missing all over the place. And what I find interesting, they're interrelated. It's not like we need one space for education and um, then uh, another one for health that is totally disconnected from that. If you think from a perspective of a place-based community, all of that hangs together because at the end of the day, it relates to land and to people. And that's where 
uh, I think your, your question is really pointing to a whole set of enabling infrastructures and spaces that for the future will be necessary. So I would say the seeds of the new civilization, they are already there. And where are they? In our hearts, in our relationships, in our aspirations, in our little small initiatives that we have already started. But what's not there is the soil, right? And the soil is that uh, the enabling conditions that allow the seeds to grow. And that is uh, exactly uh, connected with your um, your questions and, and, and the spaces uh, you are calling for. So I think it's really the most significant um, enabling condition that uh, is widely missing today and that if in place would um, allow many things to happen much more quickly than most people think. Mm. That's beautiful. I will come back to the to the enabling spaces and maybe how they need to look like or what they need to consist out of, not how they need to look like. But what I, I hear, I hear I need to be willing to go through my inner transformation and my inner transformation creates outer transformation. What I also hear is dispelling a little bit the separation of the individual from the ecosystem and thinking ecosystemically that the individual and the ecosystem are always interdependent. They cannot be thought about, uh, thought of separately. And um, what I also hear is um, that we need some kind of architecture that obviously we don't have. And maybe later in the conversation, we can also look why, why are we talking about this at all? I think that's also an interesting conversation, but let's, Let's look a bit at um, the, if you want to, or another, you said, Otto, you said at the end also something that's also caught my attention. We don't have the soil for this to land. In my understanding, the soil is our body. So our body is soil, our emotions are water, and the thoughts and the inspiration, like the new seeds, actually being planted into a fertile soil. And I'm wondering when I hear that, and that links a bit what both of you said, maybe like the, the traumas that we carry inside that actually put ice on top of the soil so that many seeds can't really land. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about how would social spaces look like or have um, contain what would they contain in order to help us in both in de-icing, healing, integrating, transforming, and being innovative. What what do we what do you think we we need to learn for this? What do we need to build with capabilities and capacities? And I, I I'm going to share something. So um, I had I think. Um, I forget where I had this realization, but when I was young, I had this kind of feeling that I'm a lightning rod. I still feel that way sometimes, but that I'm just sort of this, this lightning rod that whenever an idea or inspiration or creativity moves through, it's like the lightning just hits and then, you know, it moves through and I can make something happen. You know, I'm not even doing it. It's just moving through. And I think, you know, that can be an experience of flow. It can be, you know, there are a lot of different ways of thinking about it. But what I realized, Thomas, when you talk about this like inner soil situation, that um, that when the lightning hits, for me, um, if I don't take care of that inner soil and if I don't take care of, um, you know, what you talk about is inner land, that it just gets burnt. And I've done that over and over and over. And I and I think we talk about that as burnout in our culture and I don't often realize that I'm doing that. I don't realize that I'm just burning that, you know, from a physical standpoint, but also from a mental and emotional standpoint. And I think um, I mistake sometimes how much capacity I actually have for, you know, all of a sudden I start stepping into this other thing that's trying to make it happen um, and efforting and, you know, really, you know, seeing, oh, well, I could do that before. Why can't I do that now? And I think it's because I override this experience of, um, of caring for and tending to 
that inner land. Um, so it's, it's both of those things. It's both the burning and the freezing over, um, of, okay. of that inner land. And I think, um, you know, what we experienced, um, in, uh, on a collective level, we, the three of us were part of something that Otto and I, and many others, um, in the Presencing Institute developed, which was, we called the Gaia Journey, the Global Activation of Intention and Action. And in part, it was during the pandemic to, um, the COVID-19 pandemic to, to invite people into inspiration and action in their own lives and their own communities. And part of what we did with Melanie Goodchild and Angel Acosta was this moment of melting, this moment of actually sitting with that frozen part of our um, experience of racism and colonization in our world and um, and also the effects of globalization. And I think those are things that that when I think about the, the freezing and the ice, um, for me, I get frozen when I, I get overwhelmed by how painful that is um, and how um, how painful it is to look at what we've done as humanity to each other and to the world, what we've done to extract and to um, really destroy, degenerate our world. And so, you know, to actually move towards a lot of what Otto you shared of, of moving towards a regenerative economy, a regenerative healthcare system, education system, ecosystem, as you both shared, is, you know, is very much around allowing that ice to melt and the water to move through, allowing the the soil to be tended to so that when the lightning comes through, it it has a place to land. And, you know, that fire is not a bad thing, that, that the water, um, you know, it can mean abundance when it rains, you know, so... Um, so there's a lot of different pieces of that, of caring for the, for the soil. Um, and that maybe is too metaphorical, but that very much has uh, resonated with me personally. And I think with that Gaia community, the thousands of people that came together to experience that and really look together as a collective at racism, at colonization, at globalization, and what those things have done, what those ways of operating have done, um, that actually invites us into a new way of being together. Yeah, that have been uh, so um, powerful experiences, um, uh, Antoinette. And what uh, listening to you, what what comes to my mind is um, two distinctions that that maybe kind of can can help to to illuminate uh, the examples you just gave. And and the first one is. Um, and, and I love kind of the um, the the connection kind of of the um, uh, of the soil right uh, the bodily experience and what we um, what we experience is that uh, there is more than just um, the physical body right our individual body right that in everything social um we have a collective body which is the sum total of our relationships that we enact moment to moment and um so that's where uh uh thomas as you know kind of we we use the term social fields right and what is a social field it's essentially a social system right it's kind of the set of relationships but it's a social system with interiority, right? You could say a social system with a soul. And um, so that's what we try to investigate uh, with the concept of social fields. And it really starts, what is the social field? There is something that's visible and something that's not visible, right? And that's the soil, kind of the enabling condition. And uh, in the social space, that what is that soil? That's the quality of relationship right uh that we have with each other and uh, uh and with the planet and with ourselves of course and um i think it relates to uh, so what we see going on in the more visible realm of course is a lot of violence right i mean that's kind of why you know the the issue of uh, trauma and the issue of healing comes up in the first place and I've always been uh, inspired by uh, my teacher's distinction, Johann Galtung, uh, the, um, one of the founders of peace research as a science, 
who came up with a distinction between direct and structural violence, right? A direct violence, that's kind of what we see in the visible realm, but structural violence is what you see is the victims. You see kind of the suffering, right? You see all the suffering, but the perpetrator is not an individual, kind of it's a social structure. It's our kind of the collective agreements that we have with each other. So for example, uh, poverty, right? Uh, for example, um, you know, all the um, uh, inequalities kind of uh, that we have uh, that we saw amplified in the pandemic. Um, so that's all of those things are systemic racism. All of those things are examples of structural violence. Now, what I always thought, so the structural violence is partly visible, partly not. But what is the deeper soil out of which all of that is growing? And what I always thought uh, is that there is a deeper enabling condition that could be called attentional violence. And what is attentional violence? Attentional violence is not seeing someone in terms of who they really are. Not seeing someone in terms of who they really are. Who they really are in terms of who I am now, um, where I'm coming from, but also what is my highest future possibility and not being seen um i think is a form of violence that is at the root of much of the structural and the direct violence that we see manifesting uh on a more surface level and that's why um a lot of dealing with collective trauma has to do with these healing spaces, which essentially are about collect being seen, which are about uh, being seen and in many cases uh, moving from a place of invisibility into a place of visibility uh, for the whole, right, for a community. And it is just each time that happens, it's amazing how transformative such spaces can be just by attending with your mind and heart wide open. Yeah, that's beautiful. Something, I, I... Of course, at the, I mean, I don't need, not that I'm really that familiar with your work, Thomas, but you know, I, I think kind of, so that's kind of where your whole concept of uh, witnessing and what you call global witnessing is um, is grounded in, but you're of course the person who should uh, should comment on that. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you said, and I think you said it beautifully. The uh, violence of attention, the structural violence of not being seen, all about trauma healing and I think collective trauma healing because we are walking in spaces that were there before we were born and that create themselves through us again as a repetition compulsion of not looking, not being present, not feeling, not sensing. And and I think what you what you so beautifully both of you said is in a way we we need to be seen. We need to have collective spaces where the whole and maybe we can talk about this because for some people it might be very abstract what it means when the whole starts to see. But I think it's it, this is what I experienced over and over again in many collective trauma processes. I, like as if the whole is looking through us and it's like there's something bigger, a bigger perspective than just our individual collect, uh, individual uh, summary of, of all of us together. So there's something new emerging. And maybe we can talk a little bit why it's so important that collective systems are being enabling that seeing so that something invisible comes into the visible realm and the listening, the witnessing, the seeing, the presencing, um let's talk a bit about what happens and maybe a bit of your experience when you felt that maybe that makes it more tangible that that like the whole begins to see or be the collective presence is stronger than the individuals that are in the room yeah i'm trying to think of specific examples that would make sense when you weren't in the room <laughs> um and at the same time i think that there's both a kind of 
um, you know, what the, what I think is actually really interesting right now and what, I, and what I've heard from the three of us is this experience of a social field being able to see and sense itself. Because when, I mean, when whiteness, for example, like the idea of white people, when I've seen white people experience like, oh, I'm white, you know, like that, what does that mean? There's, there's something of understanding the structural and attentional violence that you're talking about. And, um, you know, otherwise you're walking around just in a sea of people and experiences that mirror your own. And so there is no seeing, you know, so all of a sudden um, there's something that begins to shift. So I think that, that, you know, when I was talking about this experience around race, it's about, are we seeing our own experience as a social field? You know, that, that as Otto said, has this interiority. It has this space of connection between us. It's not just about my relationship with you or your relationship with this other person. It's about the fact that we are holding together something that is bigger than us. So how do you get that to see and sense itself? And I've seen that happen a number of times in these spaces that um, that the three of us have created in different ways and, and others in our networks and communities. Um, and, and I see what happens in that space. Um, and I've been a product of that, of those spaces as well, is that, um, you know, that all of a sudden the whole room shifts that, you know, when we go through a process like this and we begin to see and sense ourselves as a group, then something, as you said, something up levels for the whole group, the whole experience changes because our understanding has shifted. And then when I walk away from that, I think about the masterclass that I did for two years with Otto um, and, and the team in the Presencing Institute that you know, for me, there was an experience of being seen and held at my highest potential that all of a sudden allowed me to um, to have the capacity to allow, as I said, the lightning to move through. And, you know, for for me, that ended up being able to support Eileen Fisher in creating a recycled clothing initiative and, you know, all of these things that could look like they came from one, two or three people, but it didn't. It came from a much larger field. And that's why it impacted, for example, you know, this was in 2009 and 10. And all of a sudden, you know, we we saw a shift in the whole field of the fashion industry that was around recycled clothing and understanding circularity and things like that. So um, I don't know that that helps in terms of tangible examples, but that's, those are the streams of thought that come up for me. I love um, Antoinette, your um, notion of uh, allow the lightning uh, to, uh, to move through. Um, uh, and that is, in fact, kind of when that um, when the presence of the field becomes more tangible, that's exactly um, uh, what it happens. So it's in, in other words, it's showing up in your experience, but it's not off you, right? It's kind of moving through you, and it's also mm -hmm. when we. I think it's actually a more distributed uh, experience than uh, people often realize, because whenever we, for example. Um, move into a deep generative dialogue with each other it's not like your smart idea my smart idea and then ping pong back and forth it is moving into a process of thinking and generating together right kind of connecting with the same source and so it's something moving through i mean that's uh, when you describe in any generative dialogue, if you really want to describe the experience, it's something moving through. And that's literally what dialogue means, right? It's meaning moving, you know, moving through. It's the dia. It has nothing to do with two. And um, so I came across uh, this, um, what really is the relationship of the part of the whole. Right, that's really kind of the and um, and and what really is. I think holding the question of what the whole is, but uh, it's very important. But I came when I did the interviews um, for the Theory U book. One story I came across is a very good colleague of ours and, and co-founders of the Presencing Institute, 
she had a so Beth Gender Noah, she had a circle of seven, uh, which were six women, six um women, women um uh forming that circle together. They called that circle of seven because um uh, whenever they moved uh, to the deepest level of their conversations and gatherings, which often took really place over multiple days back in the day, uh, they refer to the deeper shift, to the shift to the deeper level that you were just uh, referring to on the net as the presence of the circle being. The presence of the circle being. I thought that is such a precise term because that's exactly what it feels like there's something is being present that isn't you right it's kind of something is um also you are seen by something that isn't you yet it's also inside you but it's also something that's beyond and uh that so presence of the circle being, I, I found is a very evocative way of giving language to that level of experience. And um, what you uh, described, Antoinette, we also uh, experienced, uh, and Tom is, uh, I think uh, you and I talked about that in one of our first two um, conversations and interviews we had two or three years back, uh, the uh, when we were in Berlin and kind of we had kind of the um, a group that was composed of uh, Jewish American uh, 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 Jewish people from Israel from other places and many other countries really from across the globe and Germans right and we went to Berlin kind of for the last module and of course you know, uh, some of the participants, uh, uh, you know, lost their their parents and the Holocaust and so on. So all of that, you know, came from being less talked about, being less visible, kind of to the center of attention. And uh, we had an experience that was transformative and healing. Um, in terms of that huge trauma that everyone felt the presence of that has been transformative for so many uh, people. Antoinette, I just had a conversation with Dana on that just uh, earlier this week. It had a huge impact on individuals' lives and it had everything to do with opening this level of knowing. Um, and, uh, but the experience, um, of that moment, which, you know, partly can be captured in words and partly is really beyond that. What, what you, what you were framed as, um, uh, lightning moving through, I think it was an energy moving through and, and, uh, that, that, uh, that suddenly was released, right? And that kind of, uh, we're able to move. Uh, and it was something that was stuck, right? St stuck deep down before. That was, uh, that felt transformative, not only on an individual level, um, but also collective. So I think these, um, when we look in our, in our everyday work, these, so those sound like big, uh, very big and unique experiences. And how is that maybe available for me? Well, I think it's much more distributed than we think. So for example, the backbone why ULAP has been transformative for so many people who participated um, is the coaching circles, right? And the coaching circle is basically an instruction for forming these profound um, healing and div and regeneration circles um, in a in a very structured process, but something that that requires um, the full presence and that requires a listening that's more than just kind of one person to another, but that's attending to the larger field. So I am surprised how many people not only have an um, 
maybe a longing towards that, but also the ability to actually move into that with just a little bit of help. And that's why these healing spaces that you you started with, Thomas, is something that I think a lot more people, we don't have a language for that. It's not even a clearly felt need, but if you offer such spaces, you will be surprised how many people move into that much more um, organically, kind of with much more um, capacity than you might have thought before. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. First of all, I share what, what both of you kind of spoke to. I have seen this so many times in the collective trauma processes, exactly this, that suddenly there was this bigger presence that kind of held us all. When we were looking also at, you know, with survivors of concentration camps or the descendants and Nazi descendants in the same room, it's like a very explosive mixture as you experienced too, maybe in, in, in your experience. But there is a bigger quality. And I think that's very promising that the emergence of this, we just need some ingredients that this can emerge through us. And I think there's a strong power to this. And when we, when we speak about cultural architecture, I think we are talking also about enabling this kind of bigger space because it has a much stronger healing and transformational power than individual conversations or individual psychotherapeutic settings. I think there's something very strong about the collective healing. And um, and and I think another, so that, that's very beautiful. And I think that we experience this, I'm sure, as you said, other people also experience that quality. So I think it's more about that something seems to be kind of almost ready that needs just a little ignition to to really have that whatever power that is uh, available and i think that that that's very promising that we bring together these experiences here and 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 another thing i would love to discuss with you um is i in the work at least that i do i see all the time once we acknowledge what's working that something is not working we create movement and what I say with this is, for example, if an individual goes through an adverse experience and needs to defend itself against the pain, it seems like there is a dysfunction afterwards, but actually it's a function that we don't understand when we are grown ups. We say, oh, I'm weak at this, or I can't do this, or that. But actually, that's a, that's a not true because I'm I'm able to not feel my body, not I'm not able to feel my body. I'm able to not remember what happened in the first five years of my life. Not, I cannot remember what happened. That's a big difference because shutting down a memory is very important for some people to survive better. And, and I think, and I have seen that also in many of the collective processes, once we together as a collective confirm the collective suppression of pain, of racism, of mm -hmm. colonialism, of, of the Holocaust, of whatsoever, once we, conf we notice that that power is with us in the room, a movement starts to happen. And I would like to, for us to explore a little bit how you look at it, because I think there is a reason why we don't have globally social healing spaces. If that would improve our healthcare system, our economy system, our agricultural system, our medical system, I mean, the healthcare costs of having that installed in, in the constitution of countries, that every country will take care of, of those spaces is amazing, but we don't have it. And I'm wondering why, like what's the function of not having it? Because I think if we crystallize that, the development of, uh, of it will be much faster. And so maybe you can, how this lands with you and maybe you, whatever lens you have on it, maybe you can speak a little bit to the inhibition of, and the power of inhibition. I think that, you know, a lot of my thinking stems from, um, you know, the wording for it is going to come from you, Otto. But, um, but you know, my thinking is that, that the framework that Otto has shared is voice of judgment, voice of cynicism, and voice of fear. And that these three voices shut down our capacity for the open mind, open heart, and open will. And so for me, that experience, um, on an individual level and on a collective level, that these three voices are very present in all of our lives. And they're very, you know, I think, I think fear is a big one, you know, really big one. 
um, that, you know, the fear of not having enough, the fear of et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, that, that continuously stands in the way of, um, of being able to have an open will. And just, you know, when I think about particularly, um, that moment that you talked about Otto in Berlin, what opened the door to that was actually Dana, a black woman saying, um, sharing her experience of being black in America and that opened. So, you know, exactly that experience. If we pathologize that, we say that that's bad, you know, we don't want to hear about it versus inviting her to have an open will to share what her experience of being black in America is, is exactly what opened the door for, for that group of people to feel their own experience, you know, which may have been being, you know, Jewish and and in Germany or being German, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of the different experiences that came up from that, but it was actually bringing that experience into the room, bringing the anger, bringing the frustration, instead of saying, you know, people of color, black people are not allowed to be angry, you know, that, that we don't want to see that in this culture, in this community, in this world. So, um, so I think, you know, there's, that's a very simple version of it, but Otto, you have probably much more in depth. No, no, I, I think that's, um, uh, when, when it really comes down to it, I think those, uh, there are these, uh, um, that's certainly what we have experienced, kind of these true enabling conditions. You need the loving attention. You need really the open-hearted um, and, and open-minded um, holding space. But you also need the courage to go to the edge, right? And that's kind of, those are the um, enabling conditions as um, Antoinette just mentioned. I would say in addition to that, and that's kind of where the voice of judgment, the voice of um, cynicism and hate and the voice of fear are the big uh, inhibitors, right? Now, if you zoom out now and say, okay, so that's kind of why these spaces, that's what needs, uh, these are the enabling uh, conditions when you are in these spaces, but why are we not even talking about having these spaces, right? And the reason I would say the second reason that's more structural is paradigm, right? Because, you know, the paradigm, how we think about health, how we think about conflict, it's, uh, you know, at best at the visible realm of the field. We are not talking about the invisible realm of the social field. Uh, you know, at best, we talk about structural violence. That's often even not happening. But the attentional violence is, uh, um, by and large, in the realm of invisibility. So uh, you could say the paradigm shift is really to a more holistic, right, a way of viewing things that integrates the also the, the consciousness, or you could say the spiritual dimension into uh, uh, the um, the realm of systems change. And I would say the third, uh, the other structural reason, of course, is interest, right? So uh, because uh, in all these transformations, uh, essentially the same happens, right? We need to look at the picture, at the current situation from the viewpoint of a larger whole. That requires me to loosen up a little bit my own identification with the, the, the own special interests I have and just to uh, become aware of what else might be possible. But that, again, as uh, Antoinette said, requires courage, right? And there's like, um, so it, you could say it's interest, uh, the, the haves, the haves nots, but that's also only just one dimension because it's really the capacity to really wake up to uh, your bigger interests, right? Because kind of the, the uh, you, you may have, uh, so why are you holding on kind of to your special interest? Because you haven't really woken up to uh, the larger um, field of well-being that may be available, right? And that's maybe at the source of, um, um, of true uh, well-being and happiness and healing. So that's, I think uh, it is a blend between the, these more systemic and these more also personal and interpersonal uh, reasons that um, keep us focusing when we talk about societal change uh, above the ground and not below the ground, not attending to the soil. And that's 
something that becomes more and more uh, aware for may, uh, many more people of us that this is really the only path we have uh, to move into the future that we all feel wants to happen. And it's also quite possible and quite in reach, but that requires us for this deeper opening uh, to create spaces for. That's fantastic. It's lovely. And I love the, the, the greater dimension, waking up to the greater dimension of a field of well-being. That's a beautiful, and that the future is almost almost here and it needs us. So I think these are beautiful words maybe to conclude our conversation for today. I see we're at the end of the time, but that's so interesting. And I'm definitely very open and uh, would wish if we could have some more when we all are very busy, but if we have time, it would be great to continue this. So there's so many more directions we could go into, but I think this was a beautiful beginning of opening up the social transformation spaces that we need in our society. And I think they are vital is, is uh, I heard it from you. So uh, maybe we can continue this somewhere in space and time and uh, inspire each other again. Thank you so much. I, I feel very nourished by the conversation. Thomas's new book, Attuned, Practicing Interdependence to Heal Our Trauma and Our World, is now available for purchase at your preferred bookstore. To learn more about the book, please visit www.attunedbook.com Thanks for listening to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website pointofrelationpodcast.com and by subscribing to the Thomas Hubel YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share about us with your community on social media. Thank you. We appreciate your support.